and um, yeah, so that's okay. Have you done that before? Do what? Forgot it. Forgot to record? Mm -hmm. No, thankfully. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so embarrassed if we were doing an interview and forgot to record it. It would be horrible. <laughs> um, so you are on vacation? Yes, um, we are for, I guess, till Sunday or Monday. Okay. Yeah, and then I know you guys have cows, so you know how tough it can be. You actually, I think, mm -hmm. talked about that in your episode with uh, mm -hmm. Kate, how tough it can be to find people to cow sit for you. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, that we're, we're, we're definitely making the most of it. But um, up in uh, near Bristol, Maine, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that area at all. Mm -mm, not really right on the coast we're 10 minutes from the ocean oh okay it's pretty awesome i bet it's yeah cool. and mm -hmm. yeah and it's cool because like you know you have the mountains and woods that you have from the country but then with the coast next to that so kind of a little bit i i think cooler than just maybe the the, the normal beach thing but where, where are you guys out of we're it's like central north carolina so yeah Oh, like, sorry. The, yeah. the the internet went out right as you were talking. Yeah, it's uh, we're in Central North Carolina. We're we're not far from okay. Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. Okay. So we're actually consider so uh, our our home base is um southwestern Virginia near mm -hmm. Ferrum, Virginia, like thirty minutes from the North Carolina line. So not yeah. not too terribly far. Yeah, that's not far. Is that near like Mount Airy? Like just north yeah of not not too far from mount airy also if, if you're familiar with like roanoke or blacksburg at all like where yeah. virginia tech is blacksburg we're yeah. kind of about right in the middle of those two places like an hour and 15 minutes from each yeah okay. we go through there on the way to hoa yeah do y'all are do y'all go to homesteaders of america have y'all been before mm -mm. not yet I've seen it online and it seems freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really fun. It's just mm -hmm. like a big, uh, I don't know, we keep calling it a family reunion, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just <laughs> like, people would say it's like the place that weird people go to not feel weird, you know, like homesteading. Yeah. Yeah. The, place, the place where weird people go to become normal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. To feel normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. I like your, I like his bacon shirt. <laughs> I was like, we need a yeah, bacon shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so do y'all have any questions before we like officially start our podcast? I No, I, I, I think we're good. Yeah, we're, we're cool with the kind of free flow format if, if that's what you guys are into. So yeah. Okay, that sounds good. There's like a little bit of a delay. So I just have to like keep in my mind that when I ask something, just to wait before I start talking again, <laughs> that kind of thing. Okay, um, <laughs> gotcha. All right. Um, so, welcome back to the podcast. We are actually here. Oh no, there's going to be beeping. <laughs> <laughs> what? What fantastic timing! Yeah. Yeah. It's um. Somebody's here. <laughs> we have a driveway oh, yeah. alarm, and it tells us. <laughs> when we have customers pull up because we have a um we have a farm store on our property and um, oh perfect wow so all summer we've been we've been um you know i mean we'll have dozens of people here in the height of summer like around the fourth and so it gets kind of it gets kind of crazy but our kids are actually mm -hmm. like this is their occupation now we've we, we pay them to run the farm store and um that's cool yeah, yeah. So I think my husband's getting, getting them to go out there and help these people. So okay. now, now, do you guys sell um, stuff from other farms as well in your farm store, like other local farms, or is it just your stuff? It's mostly our stuff. Um, occasionally we'll sell like things that we don't grow, like lettuce and stuff like that from another farm. Um, but um and then sometimes if we don't have like sausage or beef or whatever mm -hmm. in stock, we'll have some of that from a grass fed beef place down the road. Um, but cool. most of the time it's just, it's just our stuff. So she took nice. the food out there. That's funny. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll try, we'll try this again. Um, 
All right, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, take two. Oh yeah, take two. Um, all right, so I'm just again. Just, it's a delay. <laughs> this is so strange that yeah. there's such a delay. We're so far apart. <clears throat> all right welcome back to the podcast um i'm michelle i'm adam and uh we are here with luke and tommy from raw milk and deadlifts and um which is kind of that's a fun name so let's talk let's talk about that to start with if people aren't familiar with you just kind of give everyone the rundown um, about who you are, what you're about. Um, I, I've honestly never met anyone except y'all that had their whole platform around raw milk. So I think that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, just give us a little, um, little, you know, summary of who you guys are and what you're about. For sure. Yeah. Um, so pretty much we're two lifelong best friends. We met in kindergarten and have been best buds ever since and um yeah like like our instagram bio says we have a passion for old school farming and old school lifting but really it's it's more than that you know pretty much we're just super into helping people get back to the roots of like a foundation of what true health is and getting back to nature getting back to old school sustainable ways and sustainable wisdom that has been lost and helping mm -hmm. people yeah, get stronger physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually through putting better things in their body, getting out in nature, and yeah, really just tapping into that old school wisdom that so many people have forgotten about. And uh, and yes, raw milk and deadlifts are yeah. a very big part of that. Those two specific. <laughs> yeah, that was the funniest, most encompassing way to describe what we're about. Uh -huh. Most, uh, I guess, attention grabbing name that we could think of. Definitely attention grabbing. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good um so yeah i think you guys reached out to us um after we had interviewed um our friend kate uh from venison mm -hmm. for dinner who is mm -hmm. also a huge advocate for raw milk and um i think this is something and you guys are probably seeing this too but it's something that's really um just kind of being brought to light is the benefits of of having raw dairy and um i know we are actually teaching a uh keeping a, a cow a milk cow class mm. here on our farm mm. in conjunction with our local community college next month so um it's just something that people are just like they're they think it might be a little strange but they're really curious about it you know and um yeah. so i think that's really cool um what do you guys are you experiencing that too like are people you, you think people are becoming more and more interested in that yeah i think for a long time you know maybe the past few decades raw milk has really been a kind of a fringe thing um but i think the the pendulum is starting to swing the other way where there's definitely still a ton of people that are weirded out by it are kind of curious about it but they are curious about it and they want to get to know more about it um and they're not so like closed-minded as they used to be mm -hmm. um i think maybe with the past year and a half a lot of people are getting more into homesteading if nothing else and it was something to do mm -hmm. but now i think with how the um you know food system and the supermarkets were really shaken up uh in the past year and a half people getting more interested in homesteading eventually they find themselves at least crossing paths with raw milk and raw dairy. And also I think too, it's interesting because we get lots of messages from people who either are already drinking raw milk or they're curious about trying it. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because if like, if we go through and look at the types of people and accounts who are sending us those messages, not that you judge someone by their Instagram, but usually you think, oh, raw milk is like people out in the country or other people have homesteaders, but it's really people from all walks of life people who live even in very urban environments who are like asking about raw milk really curious about it so yeah i think it's definitely something that is um even though it's maybe not super mainstream yet it's kind of silently making its ways into all kinds of areas that mm -hmm. you would never think of raw milk you know reaching but yeah we get we get lots of messages from people saying hey how would i get raw milk in san francisco in mm -hmm. new york and toronto mm -hmm. like people who live in the city and like are there are there farmers that will drive raw milk into the city for me wow. you know so we do get questions from from city folk <laughs> yeah um i bet there's a way to bring back the milkman 
you know, where the milkman used to come to all the farms and pick up the milk, it could be kind of the opposite. Yeah. You have a milkman that's delivering all the milk, you know, to, to for the, sure. Yeah. The, the milkman revival would, yes. would be awesome. Right. Um, the, the raw milk man, the raw milk. Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's, it's funny too, because, um, we also get messages sometimes from people who, because like we're, we're out of Virginia and they'll be like, Hey, I live in like California. Could you ship raw milk? <laughs> and that's when, you know, someone's maybe at the beginning stages of their raw milk journey. Cause you're like, <laughs> not really, but, um, th there is that cool site. And I'm, I would imagine you guys have maybe heard of it before. Um, I think it's called realmilk.com and like you enter yep. your, uh, area or I think like your zip code or something. And it does help try to find like the, closest kind of raw milk dealers uh near you mm -hmm. so that's a really great resource for people who yeah. maybe don't live right down the street from people with a, a, a herd of jerseys or guernseys or something mm -hmm. yeah right. yeah we um we're really the only people in our county that we know of mm -hmm. that have have a home dairy um there's probably some more we just don't know we of just them. don't yeah. know of them oh i thought you turned it off yeah. <laughs> um Business is good. Yeah, that's good. That's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we we have a herd share so that in North Carolina, um, you guys probably already know that since you're all close to North Carolina, that um, I mean, that's the way that we're able to legally dis distribute our milk. And um, mm -hmm. and so, you know, that just basically means that people are are bought into our our herd of cattle and um we're just taking care of the cows for them and and all that stuff but um so you know we always have um you know people that are coming here every week to pick up their milk and we have um most of the time we have like a a uh, waiting list actually we just mm. we just were able to fulfill our our waiting list um because we bought two more cows so we have three now oh, nice. um how many do you guys have so all together on the property we have seven total though only two of them are currently milking and and three of those will grow up to be beef as well but currently milking two um and we do hand milk so Two is kind of like enough for us at the moment <laughs> yeah. for that reason. Um, and mainly, mainly we do do it for ourselves because yeah, Virginia is the exact same way with the herd shares and stuff. Um, and yeah, mainly we do it kind of for the homestead. And we may or may not trade some for some local sourdough bread from our neighbors yeah. or whatnot. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so right now just two and we have a brown Swiss who's ready to be bred. But we're going to try to time that to where once she gives birth, you know, the others will be dried up because, you know, we don't really have a huge reason to milk three at a time yeah. unless maybe we just decide that we love cows so much we want to spend all day milking them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Adam is, uh, yeah, every, every 12 hours is freaking out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah, we're down to one milk in a day. Um, yeah. but we, when we got our two additional cows, they were used to be in milk twice a day. Mm -hmm. So we did that mm -hmm. for a while. Adam did it. He's, he's the milker here. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but we also bought a machine with them. Um, so they came with a machine. So we were trying that out for the first awesome. time. And, um, you, I mean, you really like, you really like the machine, don't you? Yeah, it's very time saving. Yeah. I but, mean, I can do three in the same time that I was hand milking one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, I think he kind of misses hand milking too. Like, yeah, it's not as uh, personal. You know, it's it's more yeah. productive and it's more like loud and, you know, the machine <laughs> running and you got all this stuff, cumbersome stuff you're trying to do, whereas hand milking is more yeah. pitiful and you know you're more in tune with the cow and what she's doing and that kind of right thing. yeah yeah and and i think hand milking can um also be like pretty therapeutic and kind of like almost like a yeah. spiritual experience it yeah i mean it can also be traumatic yeah if they step in the bucket <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah, but the, you know milking the cow when it's you know dark outside it's raining you can hear it on the tin roof mm. that to me i love that oh yeah. that's tough to be yeah or just le leaning your head against their side while yeah. you're them and listen to yeah. them breathe is like something really primitive. And I think to people who've never done it, it probably sounds weird, but I also think anyone who's had that 
opportunity milk cows can relate that yeah it's just so yeah peaceful uh, yeah. energy when milk yeah. cows it's hard to beat mm-hmm. yeah i miss that you know we've been machine milking since april i guess mm-hmm. and i do miss that that aspect of it yeah mm-hmm. especially like i remember um if i don't know if y'all are familiar with shay elliott the elliott homestead i remember her doing a video one time about um just and she lives in Washington state. And so it's, you know, very cold a lot of the year when she's out there milking, you know, first thing in the morning. And she was just like, there's just nothing better than cozying up to my cow first thing in the morning when yeah. it's outside and stuff. Mm-hmm. So. And, and even that's really interesting. That point you bring up, um, there's a gentleman who helps us on our farm, who's classic old school farmer, 79 years old, but will outwork 20 somethings all day long. Yeah. And he was telling us stories of how back in the day, and I think this is also mentioned in that keeping a family cow book, but I could be wrong that back in the day, sometimes people would build their living space in their barns above where the cows were. And the cows would literally act as like a furnace because they give off so much heat when they're in the barn. Wow. Um, or I think they described another old style of house that you used to see on a lot of old school farms was the houses were pretty much built in like a circle and in the middle was like the area where the cows would go. So like the cows are in the center of the house kind of warming things. And yeah, they can turn that milk and stall into a sauna. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That was really interesting. Um, Okay. So y'all probably get this question a lot um, because we get it sometimes and and most of the time it's in a pretty uh, negative Mm. way. Um, But is raw milk uh, dangerous for you? Like, is it mm-hmm. is it safe? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we we get that one all the time, and uh, <laughs> it's it's not safe at all. Stay away. Yeah, from yeah, it. yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> no. yeah. That's one. Yeah, I mean, uh, our <laughs> answer usually it kind of goes back to, you know, if you're getting your your milk from someone down the road, like you guys who have you know, two or three cows, or someone like us who's two or three cows. Or it's a guy who's, you know, he's got a small herd and he and uh, he's selling raw milk. He cares so much more. Like the farm people make raw milk. They care so much more about that milk and the nutritional content in that milk and that, you enjoying that milk. That say it, if it were if it were dangerous and it made you sick, everyone knows that's where you got the raw milk. And that guy's going to go out of business and his whole business is going to come crumbling down around. Him. So he's going to care so much more about that milk than a giant dairy. Or, you know, where it's hundreds of uh, cows milk in one big thing, so they can't trace it back. And those big companies that say someone gets sick and they can track it down, they're going to pay a fine of, you know, even if it's a million dollars, and then that's it. That's not, that's nothing to them. Mm-hmm. And you can't really track it, you know, there's no, uh, like, real consequences. Yes, yeah, exactly. You can't be, they're not held accountable to the level of someone with a small dairy, you mm-hmm. know. And then also, you know, the, an example we always give is, look, if it's a healthy cow, then odds are the milk's going to be healthy. And it's like, yeah, if that cow is fed on cheap, refined, toxic feed, and it's shot up with all kinds of hormones, antibiotics, everything under the sun, and it's, and it lives, you know, in really tall amounts of like its own feces and all that stuff, then yeah, that that's going to be a sickly cow. And not only would you want to stay away from its raw milk, you would want to stay away from its pasteurized milk, from its meat. You wouldn't want anything from an animal that is like unhealthy and sickly like that. But on the contrary, um, if that cow is out there in clean pastures, consuming like the clean, clean, fresh grasses, people love it. You know, they're not putting weird stuff in the milk. They're not, then, yeah, the, the raw milk is not only healthy. And we have to remember, um, I mean, raw milk is literally what the great majority of people are brought into this world on. Obviously, it's not cow's milk, but if an infant can handle all the amazing bacteria and enzymes and things that come along with any raw milk from, you know, any mammal, then we don't just, our immune systems aren't designed to just lose that ability as we age. The only reason you would lose that ability is because of putting toxic things into your system, like, you know, maybe unpasteurized, really unhealthy milk and stuff like that. But I mean, for most people, that is like our introduction to this earth is, you know, raw milk and we're our bodies are so familiar with all the nutrients in it that I really think if people gave it a shot and experimented with it and experimented with good clean raw milk from good clean cows that they'd find 
it's like a very natural kind of primitive food that most people's bodies do very well with because mm-hmm. it's so familiar. And a lot of people ask us, you know, well, how, how do I know if, if, it's, if it's safe milk, if, if, they, if the farmer does it correctly? We always say, just ask the farmer for a tour. Like, go see it for yourself. Mm-hmm. Every farmer that we know that's doing things right loves to show off their farm they yeah and they could talk your ear off for hours about their farm and you know if your farmer doesn't want you to come to his farm he probably has some they probably have something to hide Mm -hmm. you know yeah and you know people people know their know their their barber they know their bartender they know (laughs) their doctor why would you not want to know your farm foods coming from Mm. that's i'd argue far more important than knowing your bartender Uh (laughs) yeah we um we Oh, okay. Now they're not frozen. <laughs> Their picture was frozen for a second. So I was just making sure you're yeah. still there. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we tell our people the same thing, people that contact us and they're like, Hey, we're kind of interested in this, but don't really know. And we're just like, well, come watch us milk, like watch how we bottle, like any, you know, whatever, you know, we, we're welcome that. So, um, so yeah, we, I agree with that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the health benefits, what, um, what do you tell people, you know, are the, the main health benefits to drinking raw milk as opposed to what they're buying at the store? Well, um, you know, the first one is it makes you beautiful, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, I mean, one has to be the the immune system because of all those bacterias, right. And those are good bacterias. A lot of we started to get into a culture where bacteria is like a threatening word, but yeah. really good bacteria. Um, the effect that it has on the immune system is huge. The effect that it has on the gut is huge. Mm-hmm. And then that's a whole topic in and of itself. Like now people are starting to realize almost every function of the body and the brain is correlated to gut health. And if your gut is off, that can influence you in terms of creating injuries, inflammation, brain fog, uh, anxiety, and depression. So anything you can do to nurture the gut is going to be super powerful. And raw milk has a lot of things to nourish um, the gut. Also, then, if you look at how it can affect brain health with all the healthy fats in it, um, it's very powerful. And then another thing Luke talks about us a lot, too, is, you know, you talk about like the minerals and stuff kind of like for all the that you can replace so many supplements. with. Yeah, milk. yeah. It seems like, you know, between the, the zinc vitamin A, D, K. I see a lot of people, you go to their houses, they've got all those supplements and little bottles on, mm-hmm. you know, on their shelf. And it seems like they've just kind of like the, the health industry has dissected everything that's in raw milk, like kind of concentrated the individual vitamins and minerals. Mm-hmm. And then they get to sell you a bottle of pills this big for I don't know, 60 bucks. We just buy a gallon of raw milk, which has all those things already in it for 10 bucks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, what, what about people with dairy sensitivities and stuff like that? What do you, what do you say to that? Well, that's funny you said that because Tommy and I, for several years, we didn't even consume any dairy. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember I, uh, I was having really bad acne back when I was in high school and, um, you know, I was trying all these different creams and, and, and pills and stuff that the dermatologist was giving me. And yeah, I think it was my senior year of high school, Tommy, actually, he was like, well, are you drinking milk? I like, yeah, like, I drink a crap ton of milk because I wanted to get big and strong, you know, mm-hmm. playing sports. And I thought you were supposed to drink a ton of milk. He's like, well, uh, you know, I read that that was pretty inflammatory. So try cutting that out. I just, that's all I cut out. That was the only thing I changed about my diet. And it went away, the acne, it did better. The cutting out the dairy, pasteurized dairy. Now I know now, back then I just thought it was dairy. And the acne went away. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, dairy is freaking evil. <laughs> and for years it was just you know the almond milks and the coconut milks or oat milks whatever mm-hmm. and then it wasn't until uh i got my first job on a farm um someone had been talking to me about raw milk or they, they said hey you know here's a i think they're offering me cheese and crackers or something i was like ah, no I don't, I don't do well with dairy you know i break out real bad and you know it hurts my stomach and you know i can't really do it and the guy's like oh well have you tried raw milk because this is this is raw cheese I said, like, what the hell is mm-hmm. raw cheese? Uh, raw? What do you mean? And uh, I thought it meant like it wasn't, it didn't go through a certain process. I was like, no, I'll pass. He's not try it. You know, raw milk, a lot of people with, with dairy insensitivities tried raw dairy and they can handle it. Mm-hmm. And I tried the cheese and I didn't feel anything different. So then I had like a glass of the raw milk. I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff is delicious. 
and I'm not having any adverse reactions. And I kind of slowly had more and more and more. And then it was actually just coincidentally, Tommy at the same time had gotten into raw milk and he's the same way, not having the dairy before Mm -hmm. the pasteurized dairy. And then if you really look and kind of break down um, why a lot of people, even people who are full blown have that label of lactose intolerance, why they're able to handle raw dairy a lot of the times is if you look at, okay, so you have your raw milk, there's tons of stuff in it, right? But a couple of the main pieces in raw milk is you have lactose, which everyone's familiar with, right? Lactose intolerance. And then you have an enzyme that's naturally in the milk called lactase. And its job, it, you know, it's amazing how God and nature figured all this out. Its job is to break down and digest the lactose. Well, when you pasteurize it, you kill off the lactase and the lactose survives. So now you're drinking this milk that like that digestive enzyme is gone. And people say, oh, milk is bad or my system just can't handle it. But my brother even is a perfect example. He was on, I think it was like lactate for years. I think it was like lactose-free milk um, or pretty much like dirty water is what it looked <laughs> like. But, uh, and, and, but now he, you know, I'll bring him milk from the farm and he has absolutely no problem with it. And that's the case for a lot of people. Um, now, if someone's real sensitive to it, right? Because sometimes there can be other factors. It, take genetically where people are from, maybe their ancestors are from an area where they consumed a lot less dairy. So literally mm-hmm. their system is just less primed to dairy. Um, but even then you can start looking into milk from different animals than just cows that are even easier yeah. to break down. And another factor to look at with how easy dairy can be digested is what's called blocks of the fat in milk. Um, if the fat globules are bigger, it's harder for your body to digest. So cows actually have the biggest fat globules of um, at least the main three dairy animals. So cows are the biggest. Then goats, goat's milk is gonna be slightly easier to digest. And then sheep's milk actually has the smallest fat globules. So on paper, sheep's milk would be one of the easiest to digest. Um, So that's just another thing to look at too. Maybe if you try the raw milk from cows and it didn't agree with you, you know, if you can handle the taste, maybe try raw goat's milk. If you can find raw sheep's milk, take, take a look at that. Um, because all the raw sheep's milk can be very tricky to get a hold of. There's yeah. not a lot of sheep dairies out there that we've found, but if you can get a hold of it, it, it's worth it because it's really, really good and super easy to digest. Do you guys have any experience with the, with the goats or the sheep milk? Yeah, we've had uh, dairy goats before. We oh, had, cool. uh, I think we had two in the past, and we tried milking them, but it just you just don't get very much, and uh, mm-hmm, yeah. we quickly transitioned to cows after yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The goats, they're just. I've never experienced, you know, the actual milking of goats, but I've ex- have experienced with meat goats, and then I can't imagine trying to milk those things. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't bad. Like the milking, milking wasn't bad. They were pretty. Yeah. Oh yeah cooperative um but you just didn't get much you know you did basically the same amount of work that you do with a cow for a pint pint of milk you know Mm -hmm. oh yeah um we do we also have sheep but they're not dairy sheep but i I would be interested in trying the milk sometime if we could find someone with dairy sheep yeah if you can find someone with dairy sheep it to get people to drink you know goat's milk it does have you know an acquired taste for for a lot of people Right. Um, but sheep's milk is actually just like cow's milk. It's like, you know, a lot creamier and it's a lot smoother. It doesn't have that same kind of that kick that uh, goat's milk does. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not satisfied. <laughs> I gotta make you with this now. I'm, I'm doing, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm That's interested awesome. in, in what you guys think about or, or what you've done to bring back some of the old ways. Like, Cause that's something I'm also interested in, whether that's like interviewing people or um, mm-hmm. just what, what are you guys ideas about that? Well, I think one of the foundational things is that we just are always reminding ourselves, you know, God and nature don't make mistakes. And, you know, so with that being said, <laughs> Hey, <laughs> um, <laughs> That's awesome. you know m- more gadgets and more human in- intervention and more technology certainly isn't always the answer and then 
because one of the reasons why we got into farming wasn't because we grew up on farms or because on career day we were like man we want to be farmers when we grow up it's a lot of it actually kind of came we entered into this more from like a health perspective we were both really really into health um and you know I, i was training to be a health coach and everything and what we started seeing was you know foods that have less stuff done to them are much much healthier so then you start to realize okay instead of maybe buying everything from the supermarket, buy it from a farmer's market, right? Because it's, you know, closer and more local and all that stuff. And then, you know, you start going down that rabbit hole. You're like, wow, well, if I can even grow my own stuff, then it's like really straight from the source. Um, So that's kind of one of the big things that got us into the farming. And I'd say then outside of that too, a lot of those old ways are just the old wisdom, not only from farming techniques themselves, but a lot of old healing wisdom that has been forgotten that's really closely associated with rural living and farming. For example, everyone talks about grounding and earthing now, right? Getting out, uh, getting barefoot on the earth and how they can be really health, healthy with the negative ions and all this stuff. Now there's all the science behind it. So a lot of old farmers who back you know the day, if the kids got sick, they would tell them, kick off your shoes and go run around outside. They just knew it helped you heal. They didn't need a book written about it with all the science. They just knew nature healed or all the people who know so many take even, for example, all the weeds that people rip out of their gardens. A lot of those are healing plants that have really, really powerful benefits to health, but we've just forgotten. And we're like, oh, that's just some old weed. But you actually look at like an herbal book and you're like, wow, that piece of grass is called plantain. And that's really good for bee stings and all this stuff. So just kind of diving into that to realizing, especially in certain parts of the world, like Appalachia are so biodiverse Mm -hmm. and there's just so many healing plants and things around that most people have forgotten and now spray Roundup on and stuff. So yeah, Yeah, we really love like the old school farming techniques, but also the old school, you know, food system where for, I mean, how, how long has, uh, you know, the main, people's diet really just been from the farmers around them. That was only up until like, I think it was the fifties that supermarkets really became a thing. And before you went to the supermarket to get the food, you either grew it yourself or you bought it from your neighbor. And that's how people lived for, you know, hundreds of, for if not thousands of years before the supermarket came around. Now we're just kind of realizing like, you know, the supermarket probably isn't the best way to do it. And maybe we should go back to getting food from your neighbor and you know like the bumper sticker says you know know your farmer <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh it's very difficult I mean, to do that because food is pretty cheap yeah. still you know I, know I know we have rising food prices now you know you, you definitely oh, yeah. see that at the store but mm-hmm. for the most part food at the store is so cheap you know mm-hmm. it can be yeah. very, very difficult to uh win over customers that way yeah, the main what the main thing is just to get people to understand why that food is so cheap. Right. You know, and right. we just gotta get people to realize just because you know cheapest, the cheapest, biggest, fastest option doesn't mean it's the best option. Mm-hmm. And you know, and we just gotta get people to realize, you know, you can pay you can pay less for your food now, but you're gonna pay for it later. Exactly. And and there's a saying that I heard um way back before we got in. we first started getting into um, buying organic foods and stuff and organic was always more expensive. The argument was always, well, I can't afford organic. And I heard someone say, and I think it's a great point. Well, in a lot of ways you can't afford not to because you're going to pay for it down the road. Now, as we've gone down this rabbit hole, we know it's not just all about organic and you can go far beyond organic, but when it comes to your health, yeah, you you can't afford not to spend the extra money on your food because then you're going to be paying for it in some way, shape or form, you know, down the road. Right. That's right. I know we, we try here on our farm to make things as affordable as possible, you know, Mm -hmm. because um, we just want to supply that to our neighbors, you know, even though they may not even understand what we're doing or or why we're doing things, you know, um, we've tried really hard to keep things very affordable. And, and comparable to prices they're already paying. This makes it challenging, you know, when it's like, mm-hmm. this is worth so much more, but I can't charge that mm-hmm. for it. Yeah. 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 If they saw that, you know, whatever piece of meat they're buying from the moment it was, you know, 
born to slaughter they saw the whole yeah. process they would be blown away that it's as cheap as it is <laughs> yeah and, and and i think too yeah that's why education is so important because down the road when people do know more about what goes into it and everything that goes into it then it, it's easier to justify you know the true prices that people should be paying for it um i i even you guys may or may not I don't know if you ever heard of a farm. It's in North Carolina. I think not too far from you guys called Reedy Fork Farm. They're a big organic farm mm -hmm. um, in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've gotten feed from them before because around us, sometimes it can be really hard to buy like organic alfalfa and stuff. Yeah. So sometimes we'll do a haul down there. And I was talking to one of the ladies um, who owned it. And she was saying like, because we were talking about raw milk and, you know, raw milk prices. And she's like, you know, I would happily pay a farmer $20 per gallon for raw milk. And, and she knew that because she grew up having cows and she knows how much work goes yeah. into the milking and everything. But for someone who, like you say, their only reference of milk is like the $2 gallon of milk at the store. Mm -hmm. I mean, $20 sounds unfathomable, but Good she's part. like, you know, Hey, I would happily pay $20 a gallon because I know right. how much work cows are, you know? So I think it's just that education. People can really understand that they're buying their food and their medicine at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really a message we're trying to send with the whole raw milk and deadlifts thing. And that's a very serious message um, to get across, but we kind of want to do that in a humorous way to draw attention. But, to, you know, and after a while, people do kind of understand like, oh, this is much more than just like a silly, you know, we get to post shirtless pictures of us working out and, you know, drinking milk. <laughs> Like there's all, there's so much more to it than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And y'all have really awesome hats too. So I just Thank put you. a plug no, in. I'll never say that. Never, <laughs> say that. <Yeah. laughs> no. never leave home without them. <laughs> the people the, uh, listening to the podcast can't see them, but it's make milk raw again oh, yeah. as their hats. Mm -hmm. They're really cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely a way, uh, a great conversation starter. You know, you wear that to the farmer's market or, mm -hmm. you know, if you got to go to the grocery store for whatever reason or, you know, anywhere, people, people do a double take and a lot of people yeah. <laughs> know nothing about raw milk. They're like, what the hell is that hat about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or there are people who are into raw milk and they're like, where can I get that hat? Yep. That is awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. So Ben, the population of people who have never had raw milk, but they still want one right away because they're like, that's just really cool. <laughs> and we're like, fine. <laughs> you know, yeah, we won't argue. Spread the message. Yeah. Hey, that's so cool. Um, what are the questions? Do you have any questions? <laughs> put you on the spot mm -hmm. <laughs> i didn't write out any questions i'm so just curious just... about the old time ways yeah it's you know, the main thing yeah i mean we can get into spe specifics about cows you know but we don't have to yeah well i mean even another thing too about old old time stuff they, they usually maybe doesn't fall into like the farming category but because i've seen you know some of your guys other episodes and whatnot and how there is like that spiritual kind of faith-based um theme you know, another thing that's so rooted in like these traditional rural cultures was their faith level because they didn't have big hospitals and stuff to go get a magic pill right down the road for everything. Right. And you see that in a lot of like more primitive cultures, their faith and their ability to kind of respond to like less tangible, more spiritual ways of healing is much higher because that's kind of all they have to believe in. And of course, if you're living in a rural environment, you're surrounded by that like miraculous, non-tangible, you know, godly just feeling that you get when you're working with your animals and things like that. And, you know, I guess, yeah, an interesting topic that some of the listeners might find interesting is um, the old school traditional ways of healing that people would use for common injuries or issues that would happen around the farm. Like one of the big ones if you study old school Appalachian healing and kind of faith-based Appalachian healing is a method called fire talking, which is just an old biblical based prayer, but that was used by a lot of healers in the communities. Like if people got burned, which of course was very common, whether it was people working in factories or on farms, any of those kind of manual labor things, a lot of people get burned. 
So you, there was always someone in a lot of these old Appalachian communities who, oh, they know that that old lady over there knows how to do that, you know, prayer fire talking to help um, people's burns go away. Or there's another one for cuts. That's just literally a verse out of the Bible, but that people use for a long time, especially in Appalachia to help slow or stop bleeding. And that might sound really, really taboo or crazy to a lot of people, but you have to realize this world of, oh, take a pill for this. Oh, take a pill for this. Oh, take a pill for that. That's actually way more taboo to the human condition and way more new. You know, it, it's these old school methods like we're talking about. That is literally what kept the human race alive for like their whole existence, you know? Um, no indigenous tribes, no old school farming, um, communities from back in the day had access to that so they put their faith in these other methods and it's really fascinating because you do see miracles happen i've seen it happen luke has seen it happen and the great thing is you see all these miraculous things happen without side effects right without other detrimental things that you maybe get from more modern uh, medical intervention so that's that's another part that we're just so passionate about is opening people's eyes to not only is it critical that you know where your food comes from, but also allowing that primitive wisdom and that almost kind of ancient, timeless wisdom um, to kind of touch all areas of your life and change the way that maybe you think about healing or change the way you think about overcoming your problems and that a lot more is possible than what we've been told, you know, yeah. possible. That's right. Yeah, it's, uh, it would be nice if you know, we all live closer together, you know, because mm -hmm. it's hard to find that tribe or those people who, who are seeking the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few, you know, it's nice to know a few people that, mm -hmm. uh, like, we know so-and-so is good at this or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, yep. natural. But back in the day, it was everybody around kind of knew the same thing, you know. Yeah, and yeah. All, all of your neighbors at least knew who to go to, and that's, mm -hmm. that's being lost. Is yeah. We're, we're really big on reading, you know, I'm sure you guys heard of Wendell Berry and mm -hmm. um, like Gene Loggs and a lot of those guys where, you know, I read those, read those books and it's like, it makes you nostalgic for a time that you never even lived in. Uh -huh. And he's, mm -hmm. he's just, he's just telling stories about small rural communities and how they really stuck together, really helped each other out where, you know, this family's land was better suited for this and they bartered with the other family's land for this and if you know a tornado passed through or, or a thunderstorm took down someone's barn the whole community got together built that guy barn and it's all just like you know farm-based community living you know it, it makes you really envious of the amish <laughs> yeah 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 did you guys ever read um or come across the books the foxfire books you ever know you know about them i've, I've heard of them I've, I've heard a lot of people say mm -hmm. they like Every time they go to a used bookstore, this the first thing they're looking for. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's pretty much just a collection of I don't even know like twelve or fourteen books. Um, I think it's twelve. Twelve, yeah. and um, yeah, just accumulations of tons of interviews with um, all types of old timers throughout all of Appalachia about every topic you could imagine. They have a whole section on faith healing. They have a section on raising cows, how to build a log cabin, <laughs> how to build flintlock muskets, <laughs> which <laughs> yeah. maybe not a lot of people are looking to learn now, but still just <laughs> every aspect of that kind of old school traditional living, um, those books touch on. So yeah, if, if anyone out there listening is looking for a f absolutely, you know, fantastic, you know, just immersive read into any of the stuff we're talking about, Definitely recommend pick, picking up the Foxfire books. Yeah, a lot of it, a good majority of those books are just interviews with people who, you know, lived in that time that we kind of feel nostalgic for. A lot of people, you know, born in the, you're, you're reading a conversation with someone that was born in, you know, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, because they're, you know, elderly back when the books were written originally in the early 1960s. So it's, it's, it's a great book to capture that, that old school wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. check that out yeah yeah i've heard about them i've just never looked for them myself mm -hmm. so yeah so are you guys um looking to get more cows in the future or are you just looking to just be more educational spread the word i think definitely could see having more beef cows yeah. um yeah because compared to the dairy they are pretty low maintenance 
Um, but I think probably good on the dairy cows for now, especially because two of the ones that we're not currently milking, um, you know, they'll be first calf heifers when we do breed them. So they'll have a lot of longevity, um, you know, at least for like, yeah, the next decade or so. So probably good in the milking department though. Um, who knows? We, we might decide we want to end up with some milking goats or milking sheep or, mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. To experiment with. Yeah. Yeah. That would be neat. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we were just talking just this morning, I think about what we were going to, what's our plan. Um, because all of our, all of our dairy cows are bred. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we think we hope. <laughs> and, yeah. um, so they're, when will they give birth? March or April? April. April. Yeah, mid April. Oh, cool. And, um, so and we've got one that's pretty old I mean mm -hmm. not old old but you know one that's probably towards the end of her mm -hmm. um you know Career. era yeah and yeah. um and so anyways Adam was talking about possibly I mean he's always like on the look for <laughs> on the lookout for a new dairy cow um mm -hmm. you know where some people like well, look there's for, so many options I yeah mean, you, you can you can have a beef operation with a dairy cow you know just put yep. her calves on her you know or you know let her take care of several calves so there's i'm just finding out there's so many options with a dairy cow mm -hmm. what um do you guys have jerseys we have one jersey a guernsey and a dexter okay oh, nice I've heard, I've heard of the i've heard good things of the dexter they yeah, don't yeah. have any personal experience do you have a favorite of those three in terms of milk contents or production or well the dexter actually produces more than the other two which is okay yeah. yeah she she has a little jersey in her yeah you know, okay you know, okay dexter but she's the one we've had the longest and i, I guess i like her the best <laughs> she's, she's smaller and you know i guess i'm just i hand milked her for two years and so mm. have more of her yeah little, that's some serious bonding time yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. She's, yeah. the, she's the queen. She's the queen of the farm. Yeah, and she's, she's got the horns. Boss. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, she's the boss. <laughs> yeah. So she lets the others know, mm -hmm. like, you know, this yeah. is my farm. Um, Which can be a little aggravating sometimes. You know? <laughs> right. She won't let the others move in certain ways. And uh -huh. <laughs> Who makes the most cream of those three? Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to know because we, we don't separate it. We put them okay. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. yeah. With a machine, it all goes into the same bucket. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. We we um are milking a Guernsey Jersey mix uh, as one of ours. Though I I think she seems to resemble much more of a Guernsey. Um, and I kind of also think her milk does a little, just from what I've heard from people with Guernseys and you know the way the cream is and whatnot. Um, and then the other one that we're milking is uh milking Devon, and mm -hmm. That's a that's a cool breed. I believe that's a breed that at least versions of that breed are, are known to be kind of a you can use them for beef or dairy because they're pretty thick. I mean, you know, they're not skinny like a Guernsey or anything. I mean, they're, they're pretty thick and she doesn't produce tons of milk. But man, um, there will be days where her cream line is almost half down the jar. So considerably less milk production, but really, really creamy. Um, so those are the two that we're working with. And then we have a Swiss. Uh, so that it better be when we breed her and decide to milk her, that will be the first time she's been milked. So I'm sure there'll be some training going on. And they're definitely not the tiniest breed to train. She's pretty tall, but she's a sweetheart. So fingers crossed she'll, she won't be too, too tough to, to get used to the life of a dairy cow. Yeah. I understand now why most dairies like taller cows because mm -hmm. with a machine, it's harder to hook up the Dexter. Gotcha. The claws dragging the, the ground or the floor, whereas mm -hmm. a taller cow like our Guernsey, it's really easy to get, get everything hooked up. You know, right. Good, at least foot taller than the Dexter or, or not more. more foot and, half, yeah. foot and a half taller. Mm -hmm. And then I guess Holsteins, even though obviously most homesteads don't have them, Holsteins are also pretty pretty tall so i guess yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, uh, probably a reason why most homesteads don't have them is right way too big and i think probably produce way too much milk not enough cream just yeah. doesn't add up for any reason for a, a family farm mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah i would much rather have more cream for sure yeah oh yeah 
even even if it's just drinking the milk mm -hmm. still want more cream yeah. you know <laughs> never have enough cream mm -hmm. nope yeah um it's amazing too how much the cow will support like with pigs and chickens and you know the garden and all kinds yeah. of stuff. i mean it's it's just that's why you have that picture of the cow and then the pig and the chicken you know mm -hmm. she supports all all of yeah. it yeah that's what i mean we do call her the queen of the farm mm -hmm. because i mean she runs the place really yeah. um yeah. you know we we when we skim off the cream you know the pigs get all the skim and mm -hmm. um you know we've got fertilizer for our for our garden and just yeah feeding our family yeah. and, and mm -hmm. everything so we really could we, we've had a lady helping us this week with the cows and i was just explaining to her how how it all works you know with the cat with the milk cow now she's the most valuable animal really because mm -hmm. yeah I mean, yeah that's just that old school traditional techniques where you know it's a system where everything everything yeah. you have is for a reason to support something else mm -hmm. right. that's exactly what you guys are talking about right there that's right and when you see when you see a farm that's you know that's a, got that in sync got that down oh it's beautiful mm -hmm. it is it really and is. no one appreciates it more than someone who's trying to do it themselves yeah <laughs> yeah it's just cool how you can take sunlight you know and convert that into whatever through a dairy cow you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah right really yeah it's, it's pretty pretty cool yeah sure. yeah i don't think we'll ever go without a dairy cow probably mm -hmm. at this point mm -hmm. like i just don't ever see that happening and um i know when we interviewed kate um and she's been a, a big advocate for this before like she'll just say like you know if your cow is not doing well like you better be on the phone with somebody else to get you know like that's how much mm -hmm. she believes in in having a cow at all times on the right. farm oh, so yeah. um yeah it's it's a really cool thing so. mm -hmm. are any of your kids old enough to start uh, milking mm -hmm. yeah we we have um our 11 year old um daughter she she's milked probably for three mm -hmm. years now probably oh, nice. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. she'll she'll help him, and then um, we started like really being intentional about resting on Sundays, um, mm. and so she's gonna give her daddy a break, and she's gonna milk on Sundays for oh, him. God bless her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then the others they do when when he's milking or if he's hand milk, you know, one of them or whatever, they'll help do that. Nice. But, um, but yeah, our eleven year old. Now. Yeah, she could do everything by herself. It's a little different now with the machine. It's just a little more technical, you know. Mm -hmm. So hand milking, everybody could go help. And, you know, there's sure. four of us milking at one time. Mm -hmm. But um, now it's a little more cumbersome. They don't really, the other two don't really go down there. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun, though. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had the, um, I know y'all, I think when I walked out of the room a while ago, y'all were talking about goats or something, mm -hmm, goats yeah. and sheep or whatever. But anyways, we had um, um, Rose Duncan from Wholesome Roots on um, a few weeks ago about dairy goats. And it was so funny how, because Adam's not a fan of the goat. Um, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> he's not a fan of the goat. And um, so yeah it was funny because we had her on just to talk about dairy goats but like the whole conversation started with she was getting some cows like she was really oh, wow. excited because she was getting cows and it's so funny because she's known for being like the dairy goat lady like she teaches classes uh -huh. um at home service of america and everything on them and um it was just funny to hear her say that and i'm like see yeah y'all were y'all were kin kin after all because she was yep. getting really into the cow thing so um I don't know it just seems it makes more sense to me to like if you're gonna milk something to get more <laughs> more milk from a cow than, than yeah. to spend all that time milking goats but i'm sure yeah. there's i mean i know that the milk is different so there's benefits to both but and i've heard i was i was talking to a lady who um has dairy goats a few weeks ago and she said you know depending on the breed she says she has had some breeds of goats that will give her around a gallon of milking Mm -hmm. which wow yeah, which, i mean then that i could see that being very justified you know 
but she and then but she's like of course then there's some who give less than a half gallon so um mm -hmm. it depends but that's one really cool thing about maine too is uh the fact that you can just this is a state where you can just buy raw milk off the shelves you know yeah. and uh yeah you can go to the co-op and you literally have the cow's milk the goat's milk the sheep's milk mm -hmm. like all right next to each other so oh, it's kind of heaven and then of course there's the added benefit when you can just buy it and drink it and you don't have to milk it and filter <laughs> it and all that stuff too yeah. so I, I almost think sometimes that uh makes it even taste extra good <laughs> but i think that's just placebo yeah. <laughs> that's funny yeah we've um you know talking about you guys going out of town and having a someone to milk for you and everything we we went out of town a couple of weeks ago and it was it was pretty difficult to uh to find somebody that would milk just for one night or you know one morning for us and um she did a great job she she did fine and everything but we found a neighbor it just takes like some asking around or whatever and just networking or whatever but we have a neighbor and she is like all about it now like she's been oh, here awesome. every morning this week wow. um, because we'll have we'll be going to home centers of america in october and so we'll be out of town for uh, almost a week and um mm -hmm. we're like we got to have someone that like knows what they're doing and yeah. feels comfortable with it and wants to do it because we don't want to like twist anyone's arm and you know mm -hmm. make them do something that they're really uncomfortable with but she is she was here all week this week milking and um she loved wow. it so we yeah, are feeling it. really good about that yeah. now <laughs> yeah. yeah it seems like everyone who's qualified to do that job for you is too busy doing is milking their own cows <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, that's right. true yeah. yeah that's right yeah and this girl she has a i think she has a goat um but she's not milking the goat right mm -hmm. now she has yeah. before so she's got some milking experience yeah. anyways but um uh yeah she's she's really excited so we're we're feeling a lot better about going out of town yeah. now <laughs> yeah. yeah not not now you guys can you know go be out of town for weeks at a time so. that's, a, that's that's another thing it's like you know the the cow is the thing that ties you down to the farm yeah. i feel like you know with you can get you can kind of manage the pasture with like whatever else you got going on with chickens mm -hmm. or um or sheep and setting them up for you know when you're going to be gone and you can get someone 100%. pretty easily to come and and uh you know feed feed animals and stuff like that but the cow is is really like you can't just not milk a cow or you can't yeah. be in a situation where you know someone's gonna milk for you and they can't do it or or whatever right. you know so it's it's pretty serious and he he's like tied to the farm he loves the farm he loves like mm -hmm. being here he's just a home body or a farm body <laughs> and um and so but I'm like kind of the opposite where I like mm -hmm. to go and so this has been kind of hard for us as we've just tried to figure this out um as we've grown our farm and everything but he was just saying yesterday what did you say to me something about how much that this girl likes to milk for us and he was mm -hmm. like you know I don't know what to do now and I'm like I know what to do we're gonna go uh, out of town you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways <laughs> yeah for sure um and it's funny too how many people uh like when they visit the farm or anything yeah um I guess you you forget kind of life before milking and people will be like times a week and we're like I, I wish you had to milk them a couple times a week, you know? Yeah. Um, and then it, it, it's also funny, a lot of people, which uh, I always just found this humorous, when we're milking them, I've had a lot of people ask, so are, are these boys or girls? And I'm like, <laughs> well, oh my. Yeah. Like, you would not want uh, yeah. to do this to a boy. <laughs> So that I thought was a little more basic, but I guess you know, <laughs> can't assume anything. No, it's the, but that just proves just how far from, removed from our food yeah. that we are. Yeah. Like, because we have, I mean, I've heard the same thing, or like, I mean, I know this is a little less basic than that as far as like the gender of the of the no. animal, but like, um, I've had people, you know, just completely not understand, like does the cow ever not is it ever not in milk and like you know 
like one that has never been bred before, they think that if it's a if it's a dairy cow, it'll just produce milk, right. you know, and that kind of thing. So um, it's just it's just really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're giving a tour to someone of your farm, and you know, it sounds a little pretentious, but some of the questions you get asked, you really got to keep a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> like if, if they were to ask that question, you know, back you know when we had the strong rural communities yeah. you would have you would have been banished oh. <laughs> you were asking if that dairy cow's a male yeah oh. yeah but um you, you know what's funny though i have noticed uh people who tend not to ask questions about like oh what do you like you know do you milk them every you know couple days or whatever uh moms get it like right away <laughs> because yeah. a lot of moms like i think have had experiences to where like you know yeah i know it it can get sore and it's not fun so that's kind of almost interesting to where it the the mothers and that motherly knowledge they know like no you're not milking the same twice a week <laughs> <laughs> that would not work out well yeah. Yeah. I, yeah i've had the same experience i'm like when i say this to another mom you can't just not milk the cow you can't just skip milking the cow and she's like oh no like that's yeah. painful you know yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> And then you, I mean, you're dealing with all kinds of stuff, infections and, and everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But um, it. I have to you just, I mean, I have to try to remember that, you know, when people come here that, you know, they're here to learn and. For sure. They mm -hmm. don't know anything. You yeah. Know, they're, they're, it's so intricate and there's so many details to farm life. Mm -hmm. That's just common knowledge to us, but most people don't know yeah. that anymore sure yeah you definitely don't want to ridicule them and then turn them away from the farm life right at the beginning yeah, yeah. you do hold those stories in your back pocket <laughs> for when you're with other farmers <laughs> right. right it's just hard it's hard to remember that because you yeah you just mm -hmm. expect everyone to know like you know that, that dairy cows are female mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well we you know we've immersed ourselves in this culture for you know a decade now i've read all the joel salatin books you know just like really just this is just our nature now this is um, mm -hmm. you know how we think about things uh, you know with our food and and um and it, we just take it for granted sometimes like when people come here like you're, you're kind of like, well, I don't really have anything of value to offer them, like as far as information goes, because you're just like, you know, I feel like I'm always learning still. Like, I don't know right, everything yeah. or whatever, but, you know, I mean, people are just so brand new to it that mm -hmm. anything that we can offer them, I think, is is pretty valuable um, yeah. when they're just getting into it. So, absolutely. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, yeah, did you did you guys grow up on farms in uh you know your childhood mm -hmm. no um we we both had um like my grandparents um i stayed with them a lot growing up and they had a garden and i think before i was born like they had hogs and chickens and stuff like that and um but yeah we we gardened his family gardened but y'all didn't really keep animals mm -hmm. much i mean y'all had some chickens and stuff but yeah that was about it um so and then when we got married it was um you know i mean it took us a little bit before we started having like little chickens and for eggs and things and then we got into the meat birds and mm -hmm. um you know the chickens always the the gateway um yeah. animal yeah and, the chickens are the gateway absolutely yeah. mm -hmm. and then um you know and then when we moved to this property we knew we could kind of expand and we did what every homesteader does and they buy animals before they have fencing mm -hmm. and uh you know stuff like that like just yeah, get yeah, really yeah. excited about <laughs> the land but don't know how to contain your animals <laughs> yep so, yeah yeah it's really interesting i was talking to a farmer uh not too long ago and he'd go around and give lots of speeches and lectures and uh he would tell me he'd start off saying you know be a room of you know say 50 to 100 people he said, you know, how many of you in here are farmers? And, you know, one or two hands would go up. He said, how many of your parents were farmers? You know, two or three hands would go up. How many of your grandparents were farmers? And like a quarter of the room or half the room. And then how many of your great grandparents were farmers? And then all the hands would go up. It's really interesting to see, you know, there's less and less farmers. Mm -hmm. So that means there's less and less farms, but producing more and more food. Mm -hmm. um, 
so it's really interesting that you know swing where more and more people are starting to become farmers again mm -hmm. you know at least homesteaders yeah, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but we have just with our um, like customers that come to our store, um, older people, like they, they're they kind of nostalgic about like the homegrown food yes. and everything. They're, like they're really like, they know the value of that. But at the same time, like I, they kind of act like we're crazy for doing it. You know, like it's yeah. like, don't you know this, like food is so much easier now. And, you know, yeah. it's like you're yeah. making it very difficult. And I'll have people that just say, I just look around here and I just see hard work, you know, just lots uh -huh. and lots of work. And they just are like, we don't want any part of that or whatever. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, but the, still they want the quality of food that they remember growing up with, you know. Right, yeah, right. So, Someone's got to do that work. Uh -huh. sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah doesn't come free for mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. nope so what are, what are you guys plans for the future like what what are your goals for your place or your vision for your you know your instagram or you know what your yeah. Business, yeah, yeah your business what mm -hmm. what is your what are your goals yeah we, we'd like to earn more more than that you know just an instagram right right mm -hmm. Like obviously the Romo can deadlifts movement. Um, yeah, we we have the hats, which are really, really fun. Um, since I think there's no video on the podcast, we have shirts, but these aren't available yet. But that 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 is an avenue that we're gonna go down. So lots of like, you know, the, the beginner levels, yeah. We love the idea of kind of that kind of really fun farm type merchandise, but we definitely want to go deeper and also have ways of impacting people and really educating people on a deeper level about a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, you know, taking care of your body through food, through movement, taking care of the environment through how you're getting your food, all that type of stuff. Um, you know, even the healing side of things. So definitely wanted to get into more education about a place we'd love to go, um, kind of an avenue we'd love to go would be to doing like events, right? Even if it's like multiple day events where people learn all about food, learn all about farming, learn all about the body and movement, learn about a lot of those traditional healing techniques and kind of blend them all into one. So we want to definitely be a lot more than just the funny hats and cool shirts uh, people. We want to impact people in like really, really, really deep ways and then happen to have really awesome hats and shirts with it, but <laughs> that definitely not being the foundation, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I could tell you guys were, you know, just really interested in getting this this idea of the old school ways and, you know, getting back to um, things, you know, that are natural and Mm -hmm. traded and and that yeah, kind of yeah. thing like that the education of that was a big a big um you know motivator for you guys and and that's Definitely. that's us as well we're trying to we're actually launching a a membership um because we get so many questions and we have a youtube channel but um it's hard <laughs> youtube's hard like we we uh yeah. it's hard to like film everything and yeah. then go back and spend hours editing and so I'm not sure. the hugest fan of YouTube but we still do it and um and but you know this like we're teaching the milk cow class next month here and stuff that's something that we really enjoy doing and and a way for us to be able to continue that educational piece um you know is to take it online so we're trying to mm -hmm. we're going to launch our membership next month and um or in, actually in a week or so and uh, do some videos some trainings on there and that kind of thing um because like you said i really think that the educational piece is i mean that's what changes things you know mm -hmm. like just teaching people how to do these things um you know the whole teach a man to fish kind of thing you know yep. just, yeah right so yeah that's definitely <clears throat> that's definitely the best source of motivation is just really wanting to you know you feel like you're in this cool club i'm sure especially when you go to those homesteaders of america you feel like you're in this cool club and you just want other people to join you're like hey man <laughs> it's awesome you got to check it out you got to <laughs> at least get your own chickens and then yeah. and then and the chickens will do the work on getting them into the rest of the animals <laughs> <laughs> right that's true yeah yeah 
Um, so if people, you know, want to get in touch with you guys, ask you questions, um, uh, see what all you guys are up to, uh, is Instagram, that's the best place for them to go. Uh, as of now. Yep. Yeah. We definitely want to expand and exist off of Instagram as well. That is what we're working on. But at this moment, yeah, raw milk and deadlifts on Instagram, okay. all one word. And uh, we also have a raw milk and deadlifts Gmail. We get some people just yep. straight up emailing us so people can reach us there too. Yeah, okay. just raw milk and deadlifts at Gmail. And uh, yeah, can't miss us. We're the guys with the cows working out and all that stuff. So keep a lookout <laughs> if you prefer us. <laughs> They have a very attention grabbing Instagram, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, well, Check it out. yeah, <laughs> but thank you guys for being on with us today. And um, it was, it was really yeah, fun you. to talk to you. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future and getting to talk to you more. Awesome, yeah, thank you guys so much. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Girl. Yes, really appreciate it. <laughs> See ya. See ya. <laughs>